What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 67 of Around the Crease Podcast. This week, we are milking the podcast conversation for all it's worth. We have special guest Sheldon Sheeler from Top Drawer Soccer. You're going to want to stick around and find out why we got a soccer guy on a lacrosse podcast to talk about state playoffs, who gets it right, who gets it wrong, and how we could fix them. And we're getting into it right now. All right, everybody. So this week on the Around the Crease podcast, we're going to be talking about the playoff system because the last few weeks has been pretty much dominated by talk of lacrosse playoffs and mostly with some criticism and some rightly so on how different state associations uh, handle those different playoff formats and what's right, what's wrong about them. So this week I thought it was going to be interesting. So Sheldon Sheeler, who works for Top Drawer Soccer, he also, as you'll find out, he was uh, my professor in college, but he also worked for the Maryland State Association for a year, and he has covered high school soccer and high school sports for almost three decades now. So he is well, well versed in the various high school playoff formats. So there was no one else I could think of that would be better to talk about whose playoff system may be best, what the challenges and advantages are of different states, associations, and playoff systems. So this week we're going to be talking with him. And of course, we have Michael Ward back after we missed a week as a duo. So this week we're going to get right into that conversation. All right, welcome everybody back to the Around the Crease podcast. I got, of course, uh, Michael Ward, my usual co-host. Michael, welcome uh, back for another week. We missed last week, mostly because I was sick, and it took me, like, I could get about three minutes of conversation out before I started a coughing fit, which doesn't really work for a podcast. (laughs) No, it doesn't, but uh, I'm glad that we're back this week, and I'm glad you're feeling better. All right, and with me, we have uh, Sheldon Sheeler and... Not really, like, I know you, uh, well, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit, Sheldon, but Sheldon actually spent a year working for the Maryland State Association. He was actually my professor in college, and he's covered, what, high school, various high school sports for, what, two decades? More than that? Coming up on three. Yeah. Yep, coming up on three decades, coast I didn't, to coast. I didn't want to age you that well. <laughs> I didn't want to age yeah. you that much, so. um, But Sheldon also covers high school soccer for, uh, who do you cover soccer for now? Oh, it's a top drawer soccer. Top drawer soccer. I cover soccer all around the country. And I guess that's pertinent because, um, honestly, over our lifetime of knowing each other, like soccer and lacrosse have a lot of similarities, just in generally the demographic of the sport that plays, um, the affluentness of the sport, of the uh, people that play, but also a lot of the, the teams. There's a lot of overlap in uh, like a lot of the teams that play and stuff like that. And Sheldon is very knowledgeable on various state associations and how they conduct their playoffs. And that's what we're talking about today is we're going to talk about playoffs and I guess kind of what works and what doesn't um, for the most part. Because, Michael, I saw you got into a little of a conversation this week um, that may have just kind of solidified my idea. Because obviously the last couple of weeks we've had pretty good conversations about various playoffs from Florida with Lee Roggenberg from Florida Lacrosse News and then Chris, Chris Garland when he talked about the Michigan playoffs. Um, so I'm going to kind of let you kick off a little bit of the conversation, kind of fill us in on what happened in the last, I guess, few days or last week. Well, it was basically um, a conversation. Let's So Ohio, Illinois, and Michigan, and I'm in Indiana right now, all are, uh, all of their, their, their uh, state-sanctioned. They weren't always state-sanctioned. They used to have their own lacrosse association. Indiana still has their own. Uh, the Indiana State High or the Indiana High School State Lacrosse Association, so they run lacrosse playoffs for Indiana, where the state entity runs it for Michigan, Ohio, and Illinois, um, and that's where there's the disconnect, the problem. Indiana starts their playoffs tonight. They're they're in effect going on right now. It's what is tonight, Wednesday, yeah. uh, and that and that's going on now. So what Indiana does is they take the top sixteen teams. They have their own ranking system, and they take the top 16 teams, and then they seed them, 1 through 16, and then they play in a bracket format, which I love, which I think is great. Uh, You have to make it. You know, it's not everyone can make the playoffs. That's that's the part that I like the most. Um, Michigan now has two divisions of 64 teams, so that's 128 teams in the playoffs for Michigan lacrosse. That's a lot of teams. That's, I mean, 
what's the point of the regular season is one of the things I say. And B, teams are going to get blown up. That does not help the sport. Same thing as Ohio. Uh, they have 64, two divisions. And then Illinois has 89 teams, which they break up into eight sectionals. Um, the thing that got most heated was the Illinois bracket because Illinois uh, did not, they don't seed it. They don't, they break it down by region, uh, by area, by location. Yeah. It's not by anything else. So, for example, on Friday night, if all holds true, Loyola just won their uh, semifinal game. They just beat uh, uh, Maine South. Ch- New Trier plays Evanston right now. That's the one and two team in the state. That's the last 20 years I think they've been in every championship. Yeah. Except two in the last, tw- probably in the last 25 years. Uh, and now they meet, they'll meet on Friday in the sectional final. There are teams that will go farther in the playoffs for Illinois that would lose to both teams, JV teams, and they will have a, they will have a better opportunity to win the state championship. So that's where the, that's where the our argument came from. Now I've heard it from parents. I've heard it from coaches. I've heard it from players. Uh, I've heard it a lot from parents actually that. You know, there was one of the reasons was my son has played three years and he's been in the championship game for three years. Now his senior year, he might not have the opportunity to play again, even though they've done everything they were supposed to do. Um, it didn't. It wasn't this way last year, and now it, it, it now the the state association changed it. Now, uh, I know Sheldon, you work with with associations. I was a lobbyist in Illinois. I worked with the IHSA. <laughs> if anyone knows how that works. Believe me when I tell you, I know how that works. Just that one. Not the other ones per se, but I know how Illinois works. And I can say this with utmost confidence. I don't think at any point are they going, oh, well, we should make this good for lacrosse. I don't think they think that way. I don't. It's a revenue generator trying to get as many teams as possible. I understand that. I, I'm not against that. I know you can't do a one-size-fits-all scenario which will work for football, basketball, and then lacrosse because they're different. It's a different scenario. I mean, football is very deep in Illinois. Football is very deep in Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. So is basketball. So I understand there's transfer rules that have now applied to lacrosse. There are uh, travel restrictions that have applied to lacrosse, which which hinder lacrosse, but they are good for what the other sports are. But I don't see at any point uh, a, a, bureau- a government bureaucracy saying, well, we need to make adjustments to this. So it's one size fits all. So that's where the disconnect came from. Um, as we talked to Coach Garn last, yes, uh, last week or two weeks ago, when Brother Rice was playing Cast Tech, they're a first year program playing in the playoffs against Brother Rice, the 24th ranked team in the country. Uh, they could have beat them 100 to nothing. I mean, what's to stop someone from doing that? You know? there's no upside there's no there's no upside and that's and that's where i you know i i have a problem with it uh i like a seeding format i would love to seed the top 16 seed the top 32 i don't whatever the depth of your state is is i want to see the best teams seeded by however the state does it and then say here's how we do it and then work it down so eventually you get the best playing the best for the championship I don't like it being rigged in favor. I don't like rigged parity. I don't like saying let's knock out the two top teams for the sake of getting a new winner in there because that's 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 detrimental to the sport. That's especially a sport like lacrosse, which like hockey, teams in hockey, kids leave their high school teams and play on travel teams, and that's watered down. Uh, I and I've already heard that people talking about that happening now. So those are some of the issues that I have. Um, and the compliment I made was about Indiana doing it the right way. And sort of, I got, you know, attacked for it, which I just sort of laugh about. Like I'm giving you a compliment and you're saying I'm wrong. I'm like, I've never had so many, I ran for political office in Chicago, as you know, Mike, uh, I've never had so many anonymous people (laughs) attacking me in favor of a government bureaucracy since I ran for office. Yeah. That's literally like, oh, I, 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 I'm like, oh, it's, I feel like I'm running for political office. <laughs> so that was the, that was the, the, the blowback. But I, I mean, and you've seen it. You're seeing the scores. Yeah. There yeah. are. That Brother Rice score, blow-offs. they won 29 to nothing 
um, just to follow up because I, and I actually put that in my Midwest report and yes, we've seen the Ohio first round was pretty well dominated by even some of the first two rounds were, you know, teams were scoring 20, 25 goals a game against the opponents. So, I mean, it obviously is um, not quite balanced. And, you know, for anybody who's thinking like, it's not just a Midwest thing, like, well, the, the blowouts, I think I see more predominantly um, in some of the still growing areas, like, but, you know, Sheldon, you know, Maryland, they do regions. So, and that was one of the people who reached out to me on Twitter is like, Maryland also does regions. So, you know, you do get some geographical areas that are more, they're just better at lacrosse for whatever reason, for various reasons. And I'm talking about the Maryland Public School Association, but New York also does it too. They do their section titles. So similar, um, somewhat similar to Illinois, New York does it. So like a lot of years, or at least some years, you could get the Long Island Championship, which would could very easily be, the state championship in New York, but you know, it's, it's, they still do that sectional area. Um, so, you know, it's not just a Midwest thing. Um, California, it's, it's, is its own, um, unique set of flavors over there because they don't do a state championship. So we'll leave them out of the conversation, but you know, so it's not just a Midwest thing. There is various playoff formats throughout the country. I've mentioned New Jersey in the past, but Sheldon, we're like, what's, what's kind of your take, um, on the whole thing? I, I completely agree with Ward on a lot of the points. Basically, a lot of the state associations set things up geographically, you know, for competition purposes for their playoffs. And it's always been that way going back to the advent of state playoffs in most uh, states. And like you uh, pointed out to or you referenced the inequity in certain regions are knocking great teams out of the playoffs in the first or second round and not getting an opportunity to play down to the to you know possibly be in the state final, but at the same time, um, a couple of states are beginning to see that error, to see that problem, and I think they're under more pressure now than ever before to try to get it right. But to to Ward's point. You know, they are trying these uh, in most state associations, you're talking about an operation of six to eight people and they're trying to create a, quote, playoff system that they can just simply template and lay over all 18 sports that they offer. And while it might work for football, it doesn't work for basketball. I mean, you know, I'm I'm from Maryland, but I, I know pretty much every state association and playoff system. But, you know, we we have areas in Maryland where lacrosse is brand new so anybody in the west or the east of the state this is a relatively new sport in the state of maryland so therefore the north region and the south region tends to just crush everybody when you get down to the final four i mean you know we've had state semifinal games be 19 to 1 simply because the four best teams were in one region um and we're seeing these government agencies just simply not able to adjust or not even really willing to adjust to that. Yeah. Um, and, and part of it is if they adjust to one, then they have to adjust to all and they don't really feel they've got the manpower or the wherewithal to actually tweak every system to its best possibility. They just deal with, okay, we feel this glove basically fits as many people as we can and just let it go. Um, I, I will, you know, in, in an interesting um, uh, take, just uh, last month, Maryland decided to overhaul its football playoffs in response to this type of uh, competition issue. And as Michael know, being a former resident of the state, the, the, the West region in, in Maryland football absolutely is dominant. Um, and, you know, your region final in the West will be, you know, a 14-13 game, and then that team will go on and mercy rule the next two teams in the state semifinals and final. Yeah. So what they have done is they have to be beholden because of their, their bylaws. They have to be beholden to a regional concept. So what they're doing is they're playing the regional playoffs down to the final, but they're not actually playing the regional final. They're then advancing both of those teams into the state quarterfinals and seeding them one through eight. So, you know, to to the the you know the situation in Indiana, 
you know, taking 16 teams, one through 16, and seeding them and, and playing that down, you know, that's a great concept. But in a number of states, geographically, that might not work. I mean, right. you imagine right. – you imagine St. Thomas Aquinas and Pont Vedra in the first round of a, <laughs> you know, type of a matchup in Florida. Yeah. You know, you're talking about an eight hour car ride. Um, so what they've decided is to try to take the bo- best of both worlds, start regionally. And once we get down to the top two in those regions, advance them on. And now these two teams will have a chance to play each other for the state title. So it, it gets around the, the situation in Illinois um, where, you know, we, we might not have this um, uh, new Trier Loyola match. That would just be the two teams that advanced, and then they get thrown back into the pot, reseeded, and, and move it down from there. And I, to, to me, that's the best one I've heard so far. Um, you know, Virginia does some interesting things. I can obviously go into some depth about that as this conversation goes on, but I don't want to hog it up. But um, th- there's a number of really interesting playoff concepts out there um, you know, to, to kind of look at and model. Um, but, but when we, when I, from the East coast, look at playoffs, um, I'm going to probably look at a much different issue than maybe you guys in the Midwest, um, is there's a real disparity, but, um, see in the East, we don't have the problem with public schools and private schools in this, in uh, vying for the state championships. Most of the private schools are in their own associations and do their own thing. So I'm not. Calvert Hall play Severna Park in Maryland, for example. It's just simply not going to happen. They're yeah. not. They're in different cities. Whereas we see in the Midwest, you mentioned Brother Rice. I mean, for my, uh, you know, um, uh, side in soccer, St. Ignatius and Cleveland, um, you know, teams like that, they just simply dominate their sport in that state. So you, you've got a public-private issue in competition on top of the issue of playoff equity. Yeah. You because know, just take the new Trier Loyola situation in Maryland, that wouldn't happen. Loyola and Nutria would never play because one's a public school, one's a private school. Yeah. So and end of story. Both of them win their own dependent independent championships. And it's interesting because Tennessee has they've gone through several I mean, I think probably within I mean, since I've been covering the sport, so to say the last ten years, they've gone through several variations of their playoff format in general. And the last two years they have settled on they have a private school D1 and D2 champion, and then they have a public school D1 and D2 champion. Now, that is because, well, it's be, partly been able to change so much because they're not haven't been a sanctioned sport. But I believe starting next year, year before, oh, looks like we lost Sheldon. We'll have to get him back. Um, but starting next year, year before, we're actually going to, they're going to be a state sanctioned sport, which means. I don't know what at this point, like if they're going to keep the same format, if they're going to go to something completely different, I don't know what they do in the, um, uh, in football or basketball. So I think that's going to be pretty interesting to watch, but I mean, Tennessee has tried to kind of fix it, I guess, if you want to say like to kind of compensate for that public school and private school discrepancy. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, if, Illinois, Indiana, some of the Midwest schools of Michigan. Like, I don't know if we'll see them um, moving to something like that. Uh, I don't know. What's what's your take on that? Like, do you think that would kind of help the Michigan? Like, do you think, not eliminating, but kind of giving them their own? I mean, if you look at the MIA in Baltimore, they, you know, they have their own thing. They don't participate in the state association playoffs. Like, what's your kind of take on that? For, I mean, we're just talking lacrosse. I don't think yeah. it's a. I, I don't think it's a is a big issue. Um, and I actually I think the issue w- will be the in the Midwest. Uh, so again, coming L- New Trier is a very big school. Yeah. They have a big athletic department. They can <clears throat> compete. I don't see. I I don't see it as big of a problem in the Midwest as I've seen it in out out in other areas. Um, granted, Brother Rice is dominant. Uh, Detroit Catholic, pretty damn good. But Forest Hill Central is the, probably the second best team in, in Michigan, and Forest Hill Central is a public school, and they could and they could give, uh, and and they'll probably they, they could give Brother Rice a run, but they've only played him once because now they're in Division Two. Yeah. So I'm assuming if all holds, it's going to be a Brother Rice uh, Detroit Catholic Central final. Forest Hill Central, it could be a toss up. I would love that, and there's where my seeding comes in. Yeah, I would love to see 
the best 16 teams regardless, or the best 32. If you're deep enough to bring up 32 teams, that's the point. Uh, so I don't see a public-private issue. Yeah. As as much as I've seen it out in the other areas. Yeah. Uh, especially in like in New York, um, uh, Maryland, the public-private. So I, I actually think in a few years, like Michigan, I think the Heartlands. Uh, uh, of Michigan, the big public schools, the Carmels, like here, I think they're going to start dominating because they just have so they just numbers. I mean, and it's becoming such a big sport that it'll just be a big, huge powerhouse. So yeah. I don't see that as the bigger problem. Uh, the main issue when this started, when you were talk, referencing, was because it was people from Indiana, like saying that we need to be recognized by having state sanctioning. And my point was, you might not want to wish for state sanctioning right. yeah. because everyone was saying it's screwed things up. And they're like, well, we want and And I kept saying, what will it give you? It's not going to, I, I, I've still yet to have someone say, they said, oh, there's rules and this. I said, I, that still doesn't, that doesn't tell me anything. So, um, and of course there were, and what Sheldon was talking about the, the Maryland uh, football, how they, how it was uh, regionally, and then the top two were thrown into it. That sounds like a like a great idea for a very deep type of, of pool. I, I I think that's a great idea. It's not one size fits all, and my problem is everything's trying to be one size fits all. I, and I know it's wishful thinking. This is always wishful thinking. I wish all the teams could play in one big Midwest tournament. I would. That's not happening. This is all wishful thinking and and knowing this. There's never going to be the perfect solution. There's yeah. never going to be. Um, but that's what we talk about, and that's what brings people to t- watch and, and debate. Yeah. Well, you know, we got to play devil's advocate a little bit, and Sean, since you worked at the MPSSAA for, for a year, like, why don't states just say, you know, we're going to do this for lacrosse because it works for that sport. We're going to do this for soccer. Like, why don't they just say, like, all right, you know, we're just going to, you know, let everybody kind of pick their own kind of playoff format and what works best for them? Um, well, unfortunately, I got bounced from the conversation a little bit. I probably missed some key points, but I, you know, hopefully we can go back to some of them at some point. But let, to deal with the MPSSA, uh, I, I was a, a program director there for just one year. It was a contract year. Um, I was helping them transition between two new directors, and um, and I, you know, that that be a short term situation to answer your question, because this actually came up in the one year that I was associated with them was the playoff um, format for football was different than all other sports. And because of that, there was a group of uh, individuals threatening legal action against the state to make football a regional based playoff format. So therefore, the answer was to expand the playoffs in such a way that they could have a football regional playoff. So really, the the reason the reason that Maryland changed its football playoff previously, not this current change, yeah. was to put the football program into a similar con- construct the rest of their playoff formats and avoid potential legal action. So I think that's where that whole government CYA situation is going to come into play and prevent something as a progressive idea like this of, you know, making each sport work better in a state. Just, you know, hey, they just don't want to deal with it. They don't want to fight that battle. They don't want to have that heartache. It's just easier for them to say, this is what we do for everybody. Suck it up and deal with it. Yeah. And that's unfortunately where we're at in a lot of states. I mean, you're in Indiana ward. I mean, you know, uh, when you talk about, you know, um, you, you know, you, you might get something that you're not uh, wanting. <laughs> Take a look at that girl's soccer um, in that sectional with Carmel, um, uh, Brubuff uh, Jesuit, and Zionsville. Those three schools generally are in the top 10 of the state every year, and they have to knock each other out in a the first, just to see which one can get to the round, get to the, um, down to the number sixteen, the round of sixteen in Indiana, and you know, if if the if Indiana's uh, lacrosse goes under state sanctioning, there's nothing to say that they wouldn't fall into something comparable. Yeah, and right. I know for years, um, Washington, Washington State, 
was working to get state sanction. Um, I was friends, with, still friends yes. with the guy who was basically leading that charge, and I think it was about two years ago. Um, time flies, so it might have been more than that, but it was probably about two years ago. They actually pulled back because it became one of those things like, I think it, it was taking so long for it to gain momentum, but they seemed like they were actually on the precipice of actually getting it. And then I think everybody kind of pulled back because they were like, wait a minute, what do, we, what, do we stand, what do we stand to gain from this? So there was that moment there like, like once you find out everything that falls under, like, oh, you're in a state association, now you have to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, I know um, in pre- last week's conversation I had with uh, Chris Goldberg from Philly to Cross, like, that was a big, and I know with the MIA in, in Baltimore, too, like, that's a big reason why some of the Interact schools in Pennsylvania and the MIA schools in Maryland, like, they don't participate in the, the state association playoffs because it's just the rules are different and they just don't. I don't want to say don't want to abide by them, but I mean that's kind of what it comes down to. Like they're they just they're like oh, we don't want to do exactly that. And some of it, various reasons, travel. Like there's various reasons as to why, and I'm sure it varies by state to state. But there are some, you know, advantages and disadvantages to being a state association sport versus some others. Hey, Mike, can I hop in on that point because yeah. um, it back in the 1970s. A bunch of Pennsylvania private schools sued to become part of the PIAA. Yeah. So that was a major, you know, that was a major turning point in, in a lot of East Coast sports, and they sued to be part of the state. But obviously, in the in in the move to sue to be part of the state, they then had to follow all of the state rules. Yeah. And all of these private schools that once had a certain name or a certain brand or played at a certain level now all of a sudden lost some of those advantages that they once held. Um, you know, th- think back, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say I'm 51 years old. Mm-hmm. I remember when Dunbar basketball was a national powerhouse, you know, five guys in the NBA at one point off of the same starting five, the Dunbar had to join the MPSSAA in the state of Maryland. Well, what did that mean? They went 29 and zero the year before next year, They had to play a 20-game schedule. That was it. And they couldn't travel more than 300 miles. So all of the advantages that Dunbar held as a a school to lure students into, you know, um, uh, basketball playing students into their school was stripped away. And and if you look at at Pennsylvania now, a number, an an absolute large number of Pennsylvania private schools, not only are they a non-factor athletically, a bunch of them have actually closed. Um, even Bishop Hafey in my wife's hometown, um, you know, boarded up shop. They no longer had a a reason for a student to come to their school other than it was private. Um, you know, there's no other benefit to that school anymore. Um, and 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 so many of those schools have lost traction. Um, who you know, and you know, like I say, you go back 40 years. I don't think they ever envisioned that would be the case. Yeah, and I mean. Michael, not not that we're not going to talk about Brother Rice closing, but I think we've run into that with you know some of the Michigan schools. Their associated sports and their travel is, I want to say, most some of the more restricted ones. I always thought New York was pretty restricted, but Michigan yeah. is pretty restricted for as far as their travel, which I think does limit you know their their national reach or exposure i mean we're, we're always talking about you know growth of the midwest i mean culver academy is not you know well culver academy's prep team is not a, a part of the indiana state association and we've seen they go everywhere i mean they just beat hill academy <laughs> yeah. and they beat hill academy out of canada but they played in pennsylvania <laughs> for that national right. prep championship but they've played all over but you know a team like brother rice which you know could very easily it, most years play on a scale like that don't get that so we see you know various limitations. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to guess, make people feel like we're railing against all state associations, but I think it's worth noting. Like, there are limitations. Um, it's, it sounds great, but you also got to think about, and like, it, it, you know, it's one of those things. Like, uh, not, not to bring it to politics, but you know, my, the, uh, sh- my wife works for the Chicago Public Schools, and their union contract is up again this year and they're talking about striking and it was one of those things like one of the things that are on the table i was like well be careful because if they give you that what are they going to want and i think a lot of that some with some state associations like what do you you got to think about what are you giving up and what are you getting in return and is it worth 
is it worth it? Like, is it worth that kind of trade off? And that was how the whole situation started was it was we need to be recognized. We need <laughs> to be part of a state association. And it, was, and it was we were just talking about that with Chris. you might not know what you want. You're asking for um, and Brother Rice was the perfect. They can't play uh, Culver. They can't play. They used to play him every year. They cannot play him. And that's. And that's I mean, because they're not Culver is not a part of a state association, right? So, and that, and it's because of it's be, it's because of the uh, athletic association rules. So, again, like like we've said, and there's no perfect answer, uh, but I would prefer if I had my choice, and this is what brought up the, the conversation this week on Twitter was, I would rather have an association that cares about lacrosse in the state take care of lacrosse in the state than leave it up to a faceless bureaucracy that doesn't care about lacrosse. They care about the bottom line and everything as a whole. And that was my point. I mean, I don't, there's no perfect way to answer it. There's no perfect way to do it. And, but I just know this, especially in a, in a state like Indiana, where you're not thinking Indiana lacrosse, um, when you get these fledgling teams and there are teams that are, that are up and coming that are trying, you know, and they might be more of in the country. Well, if you just bash these teams, putting them up against, you know, HSE, Carmel, uh, Cathedral, it's going to stink. There could be a different way to do this to incur. And as I said, give me top 16 here. Give me a next 16. Give me a 60. Whatever it takes to make everyone feel like they could win and then level up, but to build the sport. You can't build the sport by pounding on teams and then those kids saying, oh, I definitely want to come and play this sport again while I'm getting my ass kicked left and right. This isn't fun. So... That was the point that, you know, yeah. it, it, there's depth in other states, but to go gr to grow it very deep, which I would like to see, it needs nurturing and it needs careful nurturing. And I don't think you're going to get that from a state association. And that was and that was where my my whole point came from. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, as we've seen in Tennessee as we, and in the show, and I think that's when you kind of dropped off, as I'd mentioned, Tennessee went to basically a four tier system um, because they are not an associated sport we're not associated sport they are going to it i think in 2020 um will be the first year maybe 2021 i'm gonna have the year but they've gone this the past two years they've gone to private d1 private d2 champion and then a public d1 a public d2 champion so that was kind of mentioned in the conversation as far as like you know the public versus private like they've changed their playoff format several ways but they've also tried to be more inclusive so i think it's a little bit more along um Ward's idea of like, you know, they have like, and I don't know how many seeds they do, but they have their one tier, but then they also have the other tiers because for many years, Tennessee, the champion was, well, for many, many years, um, I think Montgomery Bell won it this year for the first time in, since 2006, but you could, it was either McCallie or Memphis University School in every intervening year <laughs> before then. So you really had a two team race with Montgomery Bell basically being the number three um, year in, year out. So, I mean, they've, tried it'll be interesting to see what the state association does um moving forward but i think we're seeing you know there are some advantages to having a lacrosse focused um one but you know one of the things i kind of do want to bring up and maybe sheldon you'd be able to answer this is like definitely want to bring because i know lee from florida he was a proponent of breaking out like basically 64 teams so kind of doing and i don't think he wanted to do divisions he wanted to top see the top 64 teams which the breadth of Florida it very well could right. be that many teams that are competitive also in the playoffs. The distance. Because, yeah, the distance. And it was brought to my attention, like someone had mentioned the, the Maryland playoffs. And, like, yeah, there are some regions where teams coast through. I mean, we've talked about Illinois is pretty similar with the sectional format, like some teams coast through. But I also want to kind of just bring it up that there is a travel factor that comes into this. Like, Sheldon, you mentioned Ponte Vedra and, you know, St. Thomas Quinn is potentially playing your first-round matchup. I mean, even in a state like Maryland where lacrosse is fairly developed, like, I, I don't think they play lacrosse at Fort uh, Fort Hill. I got that right. Fort Hill okay. in Cumberland, Maryland, and then Wicomico on the Eastern Shore. Like, those teams, you don't want those two teams playing in the first round because that's a, you know, five, six-hour drive. So, I mean, there is also some limitations in – you know, with how you're actually going to be able to seed a playoff system and how many teams you're going to get involved. Because, I mean, there is some advantage to having teams involved in a playoff. I mean, I, I can't really speak to the Cast Tech guys getting beat 29 to nothing. I don't know how much they felt like they were in a playoff game at that point. But, I mean, y I mean, doing something more kind of along the lines of maybe like a first tier and second tier 
kind of hate to even use that term because it makes everybody else feel like they're not as good. But I mean, you know, the developing programs are programs that you know they're. I mean, there's just teams in Michigan that are not as good as Brother Rice. It's flat out. I mean, there's developed teams that aren't as good as Brother Rice. That's right. not really a slam, but um, like I, Sheldon, I'd be kind of curious since you're pretty well versed. You know, I've, in the past, I've given my professed my love for the New Jersey um, tournament system because I like the highlander version of there can only be one by the end of the year um but you know what you know is there any study associations that you kind of see as like oh they they do it well or maybe they do it better or maybe it's just like you know they have you have a a favorite the 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 couple that i like tend to be in the east um and and it's not uh not because of my proximity (laughs) but just the fact that it's i call it a second chance system um, so, uh, Pennsylvania, for example, um, and I, I, they, they do a district tournament for a number of their sports, mm-hmm. but those district tournaments then f- fill out the brackets for the state tournament and each district is allotted a certain number of spots. So therefore in district one, which is like suburban Philly, mm-hmm. Um, and in, in a given sport, they may get four or five, six or seven teams advance from district one into the state tournament. So you can get to the semifinals and all you're playing for in the semifinal and district final is just what seed you're going to get in the state tournament. You've already secured a spot. It's almost like the NCAA tournament Yeah. because, you know, you're like, OK, I'm over the hump. I'm in the semifinals. I've already got one of the top four seeds. I know I'm going to the state tournament. You know, now I can choose to to play this for the top seed, or I can rest some players if it's a certain sport. You know, whatever the s- circumstance is. So I've always liked Pennsylvania's setup because the smaller districts, which tend to be your quote less developed districts, get less representation at that state level. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe in certain sports, District Seven only gets one team in there, District Two only gets one team in there, but District One might get four or five. And it's almost it gives you that NCAA tournament feel where there's you know seven a- and uh, ACC basketball teams, but only one from the Northeast Conference. Yeah. Um, so I've liked that system. Um, historically, I've liked the Virginia system because they have gone through, played a district tournament. The f- top four teams in the district tournament advance to the regional tournament, which is a 16 team event. The then they play down from 16 to two. The 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 region. Um, uh, region champ and region runner up then advanced to the state quarterfinals. So I like that system. Um, South Carolina did something interesting a couple years ago and just simply lopped off the top 16 teams in the state based on school size and decided to create a class five a for their football playoffs. So Mm -hmm. they just start 16 on down, um, you know, one verse 16 all the way through, but the 16, State the sixteen schools are already predetermined, um, so it was kind of an interesting one. Hmm. Like I say, I, I, a number of states I see are, are are tweaking and reacting to sort of the pressures to a stay relevant and also start to you know get that better matchup in the state final because as Ward pointed out, you know a lot of state associations need the revenue to stay 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 you know abreast. Well, you know what, you'd rather have that revenue in a state final game then on the district level and then just know you're going to have a bunch of blowouts the rest of the way that people won't care about. Yeah. You know, so if they really start funneling this toward um, a true state title game, which I think Maryland is doing in their football. Now it doesn't apply to any other sport in Maryland, just football right now. Um, you know, you're starting to see some movement from some East coast States to try to make their state championships a lot more legitimate, you know? Yeah. Um, so and I mean, let's be honest. Like f- football will be the test bed for probably almost every state across the nation because that is the football is king in many many areas of the country. So that'll probably be the state in like you know in for maybe for better or worse because we've talked about you know trying to apply the one size fits all rule to all sports. But you know if it works, if something like that works for football, you could see them trying to apply it to other sports. And as you mentioned earlier, Sheldon, like they only have a handful of people working on this playoff system so if it finds out like oh it works football we're like we'll roll this out for across you know all our sports that way it's kind of a more uniform and easier to manage kind of system as well yeah i think i definitely could see that happening i think this is going to be the test ground for it yeah it's going to be interesting to watch i mean obviously with uh some of the midwest states and some of the developing areas i mean even in florida like where they've been playing for many many years but i mean they're state associations now i think they're talking about 
the rumor is they're talking about going to we'll just say one A two A division like two divisions of uh, the playoff format. So I mean, we're seeing a state like Florida, like what that ends up. It's going to be interesting because I mean, there's matchups like uh, I know I talked with you offline, Sheldon, about you know you get a combination of St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Andrews, and um, Oxbridge Academy basically playing in their region. Which any one of those teams, St. Thomas was the one that reached the state final this year. But I mean, it very easily those three teams could have been in the final four. I mean, in a different playoff yeah. format, like you could have those three teams um, in a system. So I mean, it's, it's tough. Like I will like. I do like New Jersey's, as I've said before, but you know, even them, like they they play like their county championships. I mean, they kind of have a a funneling system where everybody kind of works their way up and eventually gets into their group titles, which their group champions are state champions, and then those state champions funnel into a tournament of champions, aptly named, and then you know they play into where there is one overall tournament of champion winner by the end of the year. So I mean, you get. The small school, like the Group One champion, which is I guess the small school, play you know a Dale Barton, which is a private school out of New Jersey. Like you can get those teams, you can get a Summit and a Dale Barton to play for a state championship, which in a lot of states you don't. Like Patterson Mill just won it um, out of one A in Baltimore. Um, I don't know who's winning tonight, but Westminster has won the last two or three, um, going for their third or fourth in a row. They're a four A or three A. Um, you know, once those games are done, they're done. Like they're not going to see which one you know is one of those teams better than the other. And you know, is Severna Park better than Patterson Mill? That's a question we'll never really know because they'll never actually play. Um, it makes for a fun debate, but you know, it's one of those like you don't get those four state champions, and obviously you don't get any of the private schools. You're not going to get a Calvert Hall or a Bullis to play any of the public schools. So I mean, even in states that I think are well developed. And have a handle on in certain areas like it's all it's all there's always room for debate which kind of makes part of it a little bit fun you always get to kind of have the conversation you know on who's better right <laughs> yeah thinking about you know with that that whole playoff uh, construct in in because of the east and and lacrosse specifically most of our states have you know three four five classifications yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a move across the country, specifically in soccer and other states. Um, states are, are, are offering more state title tiers, you know, like Florida recently went to like six classifications for soccer. They've got eight state champions for football. Just 15 years ago, there was only four of one and three of the other. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, but that, that watering down of that process now creates another problem with, appropriately putting these private schools where do they belong and that becomes an issue that lacrosse may finally see once there's enough schools in various states to justify you know three or four classifications and all of a sudden you do that by enrollment and somebody you know a a small private school is down in 1a playing against rural community schools and just whipping them up like what happens in florida that creates a whole nother set of uh of um podcast for you to yeah. try to unwind <laughs> to try to unwind that problem because that problem does exist in the east um and and one that i think connecticut has taken a very um a very interesting um approach on uh called the success rule so they take your last three years of postseason play and if you make the quarterfinals in two of the past three seasons you get bumped up a classification next year and that's their way of not leaving a St. Joseph down in 1A to smoke everyone. Yeah. You know, like eventually they'll just be too good where they should be playing up in the in the double L or L bracket. You know, that's more appropriate to to, to the, the to the brand of, um, in my case, soccer they're putting on the field. Yeah. And and I think ultimately, you know, you may see some more states. Uh, I, I know a number of states we're watching this success. Um, and even Illinois is doing that now. Like, um, um, uh, Quincy Notre Dame for girls soccer just got moved up a classification because of its past success. So therefore I I know there's a number of States kind of keeping an eye on this success ratio and how to deal with private schools being in those smaller, uh, enrollment bands, but not really being in that smaller enrollment, uh, um, 
banned as far as competition is concerned. Right. I mean, if you think about it, like what Boys Latin would probably qualify as what a one A oh, school every, in Maryland. Every, yeah. No, other than Dematha, Dematha would be a three A in Maryland. Every other um, private school in Maryland would be a Maryland one A school. Yeah. So that'd be like so, a Calvert Hall, which you know I literally had a coach tell me uh, yesterday that they may be the best MIA team ever would yeah. play a Patterson Mill, you know, which is yeah. the one A champion. Like it probably it'd be it'd be unbalanced, like talent wise. Yeah, Cal- yeah Cal- Calvert Hall would come in as a Maryland two A, maybe three A based on their enrollment. Probably still But they wouldn't even be in the large school classification. Yeah. That's so yeah. That's uh so future podcast if uh some of the states ever go <laughs> ever go that route. I mean obviously we, some of the Midwest schools and I think even Florida, um, because obviously there's the, it's been a big deal in Florida for the past two years because a public school has won the last two championships. And that was the first two times in history um, that one of those that a public school had won. So, I mean, maybe we're starting to see the shift, you know, in the other direction where pu- private schools aren't dominating. But for so many years, it was Lake Highland and St. Andrews. So it's going to be interesting to see how all this, all this stuff plays off. But, uh, Sheldon, before we, we let you go, um, let everybody know where they can kind of find you online if they want to follow any of your work or kind of check you out. Yeah, I, I, I do all of my writing for Top Door Soccer. Like I said, I cover the national high school soccer scene. So topdoorsoccer.com um, is where we're at. And uh, our Twitter handle is um, uh, TDS underscore HS underscore soccer. So for TDS high school soccer. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we have a unique problem because we go year round. You know, soccer's played depending on where what state you're in. Yep. It's year round. So it's a whole different ball game. But um, – you know, there, there's a lot of really neat um, playoff ex- examples out there um, that, you know, states can take a, take a look at if they're really interested in trying to improve their end product. Yeah. Okay. All right, Shell. Well, thank you so much for, for being on and lending your insight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys, for having me on. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much to everybody for watching this week's Around the Crease podcast. If you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe. If you have already, please think about leaving a like. It really helps out the channel, really helps out the show. And if you really enjoyed this one, you might like one of the other Around the Crease podcasts that we do every Sunday. And you can check that out right there.